Thank you for coming, everybody. This room is packed. There's pillars, and I'm not allowed to move, so those of you behind the pillars get a better view than those in front of the pillars. The cameraman has told me I'm not allowed to move, and anybody in the room who knows me knows that's, that's causing me some difficulty. Not to try and jump around the tables a little bit and move around and try and enthuse you. So I'm going to have to try and enthuse you with pictures and words rather than movement. Something odd is going to happen to you this morning, I hope. We're not going to talk about content. We're not going to talk about early years. You, you would anticipate coming to an early years thing, you would get a whole lot of talk about parenting and a whole lot of talk about engaging families and that's not what you're going to get. You're going to get that later in the day. What you're going to get, as Sir Peter and Derek have both suggested, is you're going to get a little bit of the how. We're going to use a tiny example briefly from the Scottish Patient Safety Programme about some of that, but I'm going to explain improvement science this early in the morning because that's the key. You already have the content knowledge and I am in no position to tell you how to fix early years. Not remotely. I am not an early years content expert. I'm barely a content expert in my own little clinical environment, to tell you the truth. But you are the early years experts. I think the challenge is to move beyond that expertise and do it at scale. To stop doing it in pockets of excellence and to do it across the whole nation. And if we can't do it, I'm not sure it can be done. This is the Chief Medical Officer who you're going to hear from in a video statement a little bit later on. He's hugely disappointed he's not here. He's in Budapest in Hungary and uh, had a prior commitment that he couldn't get out of despite trying really hard. This is his life's work. This room is his life's work. This is Dayton. This is a one-year-old boy in Perth and Kinross. Now, there are probably some Perth and Kinross people here. The lady sitting on the sofa is Maureen Bissignano, who's the chief executive of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, where I spent a year of my life in Boston learning how to do large-scale change. She leads the organization that invented the collaborative model. Collaborative with a capital C. That's why it's the early years collaborative. It's not the early years collaboration. Collaboration is one element of the collaborative, but I'm about to explain to you what that collaborative actually means. So you can see, those of you who know Harry Burns know he doesn't smile like that often. <laughs> he only smiles like that when he's got a baby in his lap. And uh, Dayton is the son of this couple. They are both struggling with addiction challenges. The gentleman is now off his heroin and off his methadone. The lady, the mum, is off her heroin but still on her methadone. Now, I have for 20 years patched heads and necks of people who have assaulted each other, who have had difficult addiction challenges, who have had violence and aggression throughout their lives. So I understand these lives are chaotic, and I understand this life, this family may not get out of that chaotic lifestyle, but it struck me when I visited with Harry that something had happened. This young couple have already lost two children to long-term looked after care. There's a two-year-old and a four-year-old who are already gone into Perth and Kinross's adoption processes. It looks as though Dayton might be able to stay. When you ask this couple about their experience of our social health housing stuff. They describe a system in which they didn't trust the professionals. They don't articulate it, perhaps, how you and I would articulate it, but they say people kept telling us different things. People kept telling us this was true and that was true. And, and we, 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 we eventually didn't believe anybody. Harry and I, on the way back in the car, worked out that there were 15 different services trying to help. Now, each of them were very worthy. There was no bad people. There was nobody saying, we're going to steal your children off you. Everybody was trying really hard to help this family. What Perth and Ross have done is they've co-located those services in the one place and they've brought the services around the family. Now, when you ask this couple how does the service feel, they say, we trust the professionals. We trust the thing that happens. We appear to have moved in this little microsystem from a deficits approach to an assets approach. And it appears, certainly in the early process of this young man's life, that something may be changing. That there may be hope in young Dayton's life for the future. Now, I only have two early years content slides, and you understand them better than me, but it strikes me we're here for Dayton. 
but we're also here for the population. So we need to do our best for every individual data that's in the world, in our country. But we also have to do it for the population at large. My public health training suggests to me that there's no point in fixing Dayton if we don't fix the street in which Dayton lives and the church that Dayton will go to or the school that Dayton will go to. And this is one graph that suggests as you increase the number of risk factors, you increase the chance of developmental delay by age three. And yet worse than that, as you increase the number of adverse experiences as a child, you increase the chance of adult disease. Adult disease is biological but it starts in the first few months of life. So heart disease is a direct result of how you're treated as a child. It's astonishing, the research that's coming out, that says early stress gives strokes when you're 40, heart attacks when you're 50, rather than heart attacks when you're 85. So let's not pretend we don't have choices. So we can be victims, we can, we can say it's all too hard, it's too complex, there's too many agencies, there's too many cultures, we're never going to get the social workers and the doctors and the nurses to be around the same. I don't think that's true. I think if you put frontline staff around Dayton, they absolutely can fix it. The cultures can align around families because that's why the cultures exist. There isn't anybody in this business to try and make it harder. Foster was a very smart man but he describes quality as a choice. So choosing to do this is in the design. So we're, we're going to design our way into an early years improvement. Joseph Duran is one of the fathers of quality in the industrial world as well as in the public sector. And Duran said you needed three things. There'll be some people in this room who have studied Duran in their training, along with W. Edwards Deming and the other fathers of quality improvement. But Duran said you need three things. You need quality planning, which is how many schools, how many houses, how many healthcare centres, how many stuff, how many social workers. We're kind of quite good at that. We're not perfect, but we're quite good at the planning thing. You need quality assurance, so you need scrutiny. You need to inspect at some level. You need to go into the schools and check. You need to make sure there's fire extinguishers and disabled access, and you need to go to the hospitals and check they're clean. So that's quality assurance. I, I think we're relatively good at scrutiny. There's people here from Healthcare Improvement Scotland. That's one of the things Healthcare Improvement Scotland does in our NHS. We've got checks, we've got scrutineers and scrutiny. We're quite good at quality assurance. Duran said the gap was in quality improvement. The continuous improvement of those services and processes that we've planned and scrutinised. Scrutiny by itself is only one side of a coin. You can't, you can't scrutinise without having a way of improving it, and I think that's the gap. Doing quality improvement at scale is where we've found it hard. Our traditional approach to improvement is the hamster wheel on your right. So we just tell everybody to run faster, work harder, do more for less. Those people are off sick because it's too hard, you'll just pick up that workload. Just run, 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 run. When I went to IHI in the States six years ago, I, I learned that you could do the other thing, not just sit in your backside all day, but you, you, you could stop. And to stop and redesign, and I don't mean structural redesign, I don't mean stop and blow up the health service and change it, that's no political reference, it's just reality. I mean stop and redesign. Running faster is not the solution. And quality improvement, there are multiple definitions, some of which are healthcare focused, some of which are social care focused. This is my favourite. Quality improvement is a broad range of activities of varying degrees of complexity and methodological and statistical rigour through which providers develop and implement and assess small scale interventions, identify those that work well and implement them more broadly. So let's have a little think about what that might actually mean. So this room suggests we already have will. Everywhere I go, Derek and I were in uh, Fife last week in the council. I've been in Perth and Kin Ross, as you can see, relatively recently. I've been around a few councils. I'm, I'm in healthcare systems all the time. I, I don't worry about will. I don't worry about ideas. I think there are lots of early years solutions. There are lots of things that you already know that when done right, early years improves. It may be that you have to give up your particular favorite because we can't do everybody's favorite. 
But in there somewhere are lots and lots and lots of ideas. I think the challenge is in execution. This is an IHI model, will, ideas, and execution. And pretty much everybody in the world struggles with implementation or execution. So in healthcare, we have a big problem. And our big problem is we've got a lot of knowledge. We've got a lot of discovery stuff. And this is true in other public sectors too, that there's a lot of new stuff, new drugs, new systems, new things. But it takes us nearly 20 years to get that into practice. I did a PhD using a drug and a fancy pump, and I invented this fancy thing. And I proved that this drug was safer than the standard drug. I did that 12 years ago. I'm still the only person who believes that to be true. I published a definitive study that says that is better than that, and still everybody's using the previous version. It's going to take at least 20 years before anybody believes me. And I've moved my job, so now nobody believes me. I've still got the only version of that pump that's in my kitchen. Away in the back of a cupboard. If you want drugs, I can... No, that's a different, <laughs> that's a different lecture entirely. It takes nearly 20 years to get tiny bits of that evidence into practice. The literature varies about how many people are harmed in our healthcare system. And this is my Scottish patient safety program example. And I'm not going to dwell on it because it, it, it has things to teach us, but it's not the answer to early years, obviously. But we had, a, we had a problem. Too many people are harmed by the healthcare they receive, not by the disease they arrive with. So there's one version of that which suggests in this study that a quarter of the patients in the North Carolina healthcare system were harmed by the care they receive. The global literature varies from 1 in 10 to 1 in 4. We have no reason in Scotland to believe we're any worse or any better than the rest of the world. That's a range of things. Infections, pressure ulcers, falling over and breaking something, drug errors which require an extra few days in hospital. So we decided to do something dramatic. We didn't spend four years in working groups. We didn't print a glossy brochure. We just did a thing. And I can remember this version for the Scottish Patient Safety Programme. It was in the March of 2007, and we then did the first learning event for the safety programme in the January of 2008. And we launched an evidence-based collaborative with IHI as our partner. Its aim was to reduce inpatient mortality by 15%. Now, those of you who have worked in the healthcare system may understand the scale of that aim. That we were booed off stages. People wrote letters to the minister to say, you've gone completely mad. A 15% reduction in mortality is impossible. We did it so that people wouldn't keep running on the hamster wheel. We did it so people would stop. We then described a method, and that method is crucial, and that was the collaborative method, which I'm going to describe to you in a second. Deming said that you wouldn't get in the room to talk to W. Edwards Deming unless you had two things. You needed an aim and you needed to be able to articulate a method. Otherwise, he wasn't interested in talking to you. He had too many people to see. And if he couldn't do those two things. Now, we had a method. You don't need to understand the detail of it. But the safety program has an articulated method. It did a breakthrough series collaborative underpinned by the model for improvement. And that's exactly what we're going to do with everybody's help in this room and lots of others around the early years collective. This is the collaborative model. Now, I'm going to take this slide away in a minute. It's a bit like that game when you've got kids where you take things away and you've got to guess what was there. You remember that? So we're going to start and build that slide gradually. So this is IHI's Breakthrough Series Collaborative. And please don't mix it up with collaboration. It's very specific. It's a learning system. Now, you don't have to choose the collaborative method. There are lots of other methods. But here we are. We've chosen the collaborative method. So get over it. <laughs> so you select your topic, your topic is early years. You then get the experts together, this room and other rooms like it, and you decide what your aim is. You bring these people together and there's been a number of these expert meetings already, there's been three led by Shirley and Donna and others around the country, to start to think about what the change package, the framework for changes might be. You then get a group of experts and a combination of content experts so early years people, and improvement experts, people who do large scale change, people who understand there's a science behind large scale change. There's not just a random element to large scale change. Glossy brochures and letters telling chief executives of local authorities to work harder, lo and behold, does, doesn't work. So you have to have the science behind that large scale change. And then you get the teams together. So we're going to use the CPPs as, a, as the system, 
the leadership system, and then underneath that will be the workers. So that will be a midwife and a community nurse and a social worker and a housing officer and whatever that frontline thing is that you decide to be. But the, the leadership table or the leadership group is equally important because they will have to change the way they work. Pre-work is an IHI word for work. So just work before something else. It's, just, it's not any less than proper work. They just call it pre-work because it comes before the learning event. And then you bring everybody together in what's called LS1, the first learning session. People come expecting a conference. They come expecting talking heads at the front to teach them stuff. That's not what happens. It's a two-day working thing where you come and you learn improvement. You don't learn early years. You already know early years. What you learn is large-scale change. You learn the model for improvement. You learn how to do small cycle testing. And that's what we're going to do in January with your teams and you as we plan what we're going to do for the next 18 months, two years, and beyond. I try then have another word for work, and it's called an action period. So you then have a three-month, roughly, action period where the teams go back and they test. They use the model for improvement to do small cycle testing in tiny, tiny microsystems to try and institute the changes that we will then take to scale. And then you repeat that. You come back together at the SECC, probably because it's the only place big enough in Scotland to hold us all. For the safety program, we had 700, 900 people from the healthcare system at each of these learning events. In November, we're about to do learning session nine of the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, four and a half years, five years after we started. And then you can, keep, you can keep that cycle moving. Traditionally, IHI say after 18 months to two years, you should begin to think about where you've got to, how you're going to do it. And then underpinning all of that is a set of support. It's, you can't just let these people out without having some kind of mechanism for sharing. So there are a number of ways of keeping everybody in touch with everybody else. Measurement is crucial. So there will be a system whereby people can, can submit their measures. They'll be able to see everybody else's measures, and they'll be able to see their own, and they'll be able to track that measurement over time. Some of that measurement will be in tiny systems. Some of it will be bigger measures across our whole system that won't move for a long time. There'll be site visits. There'll be phone conferences on early year stuff. There'll be, you get the idea. So let's go back again to the safety program. So this is the latest mortality data. Remember I told you we want a 15% reduction in inpatient mortality by the end of this year. So our mortality data is a little bit behind. So it's, this is January, March 2012, which is my latest numbers. And we've had nearly 10,000 fewer than expected deaths since the beginning of January 2008. And our mortality ratio, which is number of actual deaths over number of expected deaths, because we know how many people roughly would die within our system if care stayed the same, is 0.89. And if you graph that over time, that's a 10.6% reduction up to the end of March 2012. We have nine months to go. I don't know if we're going to get to 15%. And the big secret is, I don't care. I care only that it changed the system. I maybe care for my employment, <laughs> but I don't care that much if we've only reduced mortality by 14%. <laughs> the idea of the aim was to redesign the system and to make changes. The most astonishing reduction in those, is in those having surgery. It says everybody who has an operation in Scotland and dies during that hospital stay. We do about half a million operations a year in NHS Scotland. And mortality has stayed the same for roughly 20 years, no matter what we do, no matter how hard we try. The movement from inpatient to day surgery, the increased use of antibiotics wisely, improving anesthesia. For 20 years, nothing happened. And now it's fallen by a third. You're a third less likely to die today if you have an operation than four years ago. It's very difficult to say what single thing did that, because it isn't a single thing. It's multiple things. It's better team working, it's better infection control, it's better intensive care, it's better lots of different things. See how limited I feel standing in this lecture? I'm just going to repeatedly batter the microphone, that will make them move me. What I think this is actually is the surgical checklist. The surgical checklist is an intervention that has gone into every operating theatre in Scotland and it's from the airline industry and it says, what's the patient's name? Is it the right operation? Is it the proper leg? Is the, does everybody in the room know each other's name? Do we know where the oxygen cylinder is? If, you may be surprised to know that didn't happen routinely four or five years ago. Now it happens in every operation in Scotland, pretty much. 
It's quite hard to find an operating theatre not doing the checklist. The checklist isn't magic, but the checklist is a human factors improvement solution to try and make the team work better together. It's just a tiny example inside the safety programme that's led to that change. Probably the highest profile change within the safety programme is the C. difficile reduction. The safety programme, along with the HII task force and a whole load of other stuff, particularly antibiotic stewardship, so the difficult, I now can't prescribe a set of my favourite antibiotics unless I go with my own money, my own blood to the pharmacy and say, look, I really need this drug for this particular lady and I need to sign this chitty to get me it because too many people were getting C. difficile. So human factor solution to reduce C. difficile, that's a 90% reduction. That's globally leading. Now, we started quite high, so the 90% reduction looks better than perhaps it should, but we have almost got rid of C. difficile. These methods have been applied in different places. This is the care home residency numbers. So blue, light blue, is our actual number of people over 65 in care homes. If we had stayed with the same trajectory, we would have had 6,500 more people in care homes than we have now. This is multifactorial. It's a lot of social care changes. It's, but it's also the long-term conditions collaborative. It's other unscheduled care collaboratives. It's other pieces of improvement work that others have led that have managed to reduce multi-agency change into our public sector. So I have a bias. And my bias is that task leads to culture change. I don't believe navel-gazing changes culture. I think we can have as many working groups as you like, but it's not going to change a thing. I think we need to act our way into culture change. Now that acting has to be designed, it has to be collective, it has to be collaborative, we have to do it together, but I believe we need to start. I actually have run a collaborative in New York, started in New York and is now spread across the whole of North America, and their plan was to put 100,000 homeless people into homes. They started with a little tiny system in New York where they did all the changes, they experimented, they did the model for improvement. And now you can see where all the red dots are. They're now in all these major towns in North America. And here's where they are so far, or up until the end of July. There's 10,500 people housed. There are 87 different communities participating. You get the idea. There are 711 days remaining. So they're running it like a campaign and a collaborative. So they're getting, using the same methods we're using. But this is multi-agency work. This is not single sector. MD working in homelessness well, no, this is not just about homes. This is about addiction, it's about mental health, it's about housing, it's about social work, it's about families, it's about kids. So using the same, the same methodology to tackle a complex problem. Now, I don't have any time at all to teach you the model for improvement because learning session one will do that at scale. It will teach you and all the workers the model for improvement. It's what the bulk of the time will be spent doing. But the model for improvement is deceptively simple. It's the engine which drives the change package. And it's about having an aim, having measures which you know you can monitor, and having changes which will then lead to that, and then having an implementation cycle. Some of you will have come across it as Plan Do Check Act. Some of you will have heard of PDSAs, but various versions of it, but will we'll, we'll teach very, very strongly how to do it. It is the core method of the thing. Now we're going to have to learn new things. We're going to have to stop counting once, changing for a year and counting again. Because lo and behold, when you have two numbers, it's very likely one will be different from the other. That's not my joke, that's an Edward Deming joke. It's not a very good joke, but it's... Run charts are tracking measures over time. So you can monitor the system over time. The numbers start to tell you a story. We're going to have to learn to be more transparent. So the healthcare system now exposes that safety data to each other. There are no secrets in that transparency data. Now, that's been a challenge for all kinds of levels in, in our system to learn that that measurement is it's not the most robust measurement in the world. It's counted by people down and dirty, if you like, in the front lines who, who are just counting to try and make change in hand-washing data or in infection data in their wards and in their clinics around the world. And then all of measurement is a concept of you don't get a number, you don't get a tick unless you do all five things or all four 
things. And the testing is crucial. You'll start to hear this afternoon from the work streams, so you'll start to work out yourselves what's going to be in these work streams. But then the temptation will be to say, this is the change package, this is what everybody needs, off you go. And we know that that doesn't work. We've been trying that for decades. So we have to test in every individual context. So every context gets to design the changes for their own context. So it won't be the same in Fife and Perth. It will be different. The core will be the same. Of course it will. We're trying to fix early years. We're trying to get better attachment. We're trying to get infant mortality down. But the local context will be allowed to adapt those changes to their particular setting. This is the worst news I've given you. It's no longer enough to have the best social workers in the world. I think my sister is the best social worker in the world. She thinks that too. <laughs> I think I'm the best oral surgeon in the world. It's clearly garbage. I think we probably have the best professionals in the world. Scotland has the best professional schools in the world. We have the best people. And yet still, too many people are harmed, too many kids suffer, too many families are not getting the services which they should get from us and from others. And it's not because you have bad people, it's because the systems are too difficult. So getting beyond that, having the best professionals in the world, is the big step. Let me finish with this little story. I have a, an orphanage that I'm connected to in southeast India that I go to every year or two. This is the five-year-olds in that orphanage. In the back of that crowd is this little girl. Her name is Mariama. This is when she was four years old. This is 20 years ago. First time I ever went. I took 16 teeth out of Mariama. She only has 20. She was dropped off at the front door of the orphanage by an auntie, we think. We're not entirely sure. And the orphanage took her in age four. And the orphanage, by default, brings the services around this kid. They don't, they don't articulate it like we articulate it. But she got food and shelter, and she got health care, poor girl, because she met me. She got services around her. Everything was built around the kid. Now, it just so happens her version of that is extreme because she's in rural India with very little resource. This orphanage started with two children and a man called Prasada Rao who took those two children into his own house. It now has 2,000 children. It has a university. It has a nursing school. It has a teaching school. And this is Mariama, age 24. She's a teacher in the orphanage. Because the services, the assets which she had, were used. We didn't treat her in a deficit way. Everything that was available to her became available to her in an easy to use way. And Mariama is now married, teacher in the school, doing well. And if you'd thought that, and she has good teeth. <laughs> and if you'd thought that 20 years ago, I, I wouldn't have believed you. I would not have believed you. I, I hope this isn't your ambition. <laughs> <laughs> it, if it is, you're in the wrong room. You should go somewhere else. This is a real sign in a real American school. I, I, I don't think that's where we are. I, I think genuinely this is the beginning of something enormous in Scotland. I think we already have the potential and the early years collaborative will perhaps allow us to move to the next level. Thank you very much for listening.